Okay, I think we'll get started. So welcome to the Helix webinar series. Today's session is on unlock deep visibility into your IT environment with BMC Helix ITOM release. Today's presenters are John Thomas, our Senior Director from Product Management, and joining him is John Ahern, our Principal Solutions Marketing Manager. We also have a special guest, which I will make sure that John introduces. Um, just a couple of um, reminders for those that haven't used um, Zoom before. We have the Zoom Q&A section at the mm -hmm. bottom where you can ask your questions during the session. And due to the amount of content, we won't be opening up to live Q&A. So we would really encourage that you use the Q&A section of Zoom. So without further ado, I'm going to hand over to John Hearn to start us off with the introductions. Cheers. Uh, thanks for that, uh, Samantha. And uh, really excited uh, to catch up with everyone today and to share the latest um, BMC Helix ITOM release. It's, um, it's something that we like to do with every one of our, our major releases. And today we've got a, an agenda that's packed full of uh, goodness. So we really think you're going to get lots of value out of this um, this webinar today. So just a legal notice here, um, basically covering um, covering a couple of legal things we need to be aware of. And if we can flick then into the agenda, uh, I'll let everyone know uh, what's going to happen in today's uh, webinar. So as uh, Samantha mentioned, I'm uh, John Ahern. I look after our AI ops portfolio from a solutions marketing uh, point of view. I work very closely with the colleagues uh, here on, on the call today. Mm -hmm. And then one of my uh, main responsibilities is to make sure that all the assets and collateral are is created to help us uh, learn more, I guess, about our BMC uh, AI ops capability when it comes to our ITOM portfolio. I'm delighted to be joined by uh, John Thomas, um, uh, or as we call him, JT. JT, would you like to say hello to everyone today? Sure. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, I'm John Thomas, or as you can see, we got a call of four people, and two of them are John, so I go by my initials, JT. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. I'm a Senior Director of Product Management working in our IT Operations Management Portfolio. Cheers, uh, cheers, JT. And uh, yeah, just to let everyone know, there's multiple Johns within uh, BMC, so uh, <laughs> it's tricky at times. Uh, but once uh, JT takes us through right, a lot of our, our great new capabilities that we have in this uh, latest launch, um, I also should flag as well, we've got a little bit of a look forward or a sneak peek into an upcoming feature there as well. So keep an eye out for that towards the end of uh, JT's section in today's webinar. But once we've kind of done a bit of context setting and shown you a little bit what, what's going to be in this release, I'm delighted to say we're also joined by Mateus here as well, who's uh, one of our uh, solution engineering um, members here. Mateus, do you want to say hi to everyone? Introduce yourself. Yeah, thanks, John. Hi, everyone. I'm Mateus. I'm a solution engineer uh, specialized in the area of AI ops. I will do a live demo as well. I'm based in Austria, and I'm not just here to break the the the, the Johns on the on the, on the slide, <laughs> first name. So pretty excited. Yeah. Cheers, Mateus. I'm delighted to have you as well. So I'm lucky enough to have seen uh, Mateus demo these solutions in the past, and he does a really, really great job. So can't wait till we get to his section today as well. Uh, and then look towards the end of today's session, obviously, we're going to run a Q&A or questions and answers session. So please feel free to use the chat or the Q&A section, whatever kind of works for you there. We'll be monitoring it throughout and uh, we'll get to your questions at the end of today's session. So Looking forward to, to kicking this all off and getting going with uh, today's webinar. So over to you, JT, and uh, take it from here. All right. Thanks a lot, John. Uh, so before we get into talking about the really great and exciting things that are uh, in the upcoming or actually in most in the recent release, uh, I want to set a little bit of context on why it is that we're doing what we're doing and why are we focusing on specific areas. And you know, I've, I've, I've seen talking with a lot of customers over the past few years, there's a change. So organizations are really getting a lot of pressure to modernize their digital experiences. So for a lot of organizations, that really is what we're talking about is, is the digital services that they're running. And so whether you're uh, a financial services company um, providing applications now to your, your end users as a direct interface or retail or telco, or even I'm starting to see government services being pushed to improve the way that they're interacting with their customers and improve their uh, experience. There's a, a lot of demands that are out there. And, and, and along with these digital services, there's the expectation that they're being delivered with 
high reliability and service performance. Because if you build the service, you want people to actually be able to use it and use it well. And there's a need to keep up with the constant amount of change. A lot of people are adopting DevOps. So you need to not only create these digital services and run these digital services, but do it while you're making lots and lots of updates. And at the same time, we're all being asked to be very judicious with our employee resources, as well as our infrastructure resources to make sure that we're, we're really being efficient in what we're doing. And you say, hey, JT, that sounds great, but running digital services, it's really challenging. Uh, and if you look at like why it's challenging, well, we've got these more critical services than ever. They're more critical than ever. We've got not just back-end systems that have to be uh, used by employees, but they're the front end, the face of the business, your customers are interacting with them. And then if we look behind those digital services, they're being backed by some rather complicated uh, app and infrastructure and network. If you're like most companies, you got maybe some modern apps that are out there, microservice-based apps, but it didn't mean that you got to retire all your three-tier applications that are out there. It didn't mean that you had to stop monitoring your your commercial off-the-shelf software. And on the infrastructure side, you probably still have some servers and some mainframe, but you also have your virtualization, multiple public cloud providers, containers, databases, storage, traditional network, SDN, cloud network, and your container network. And they don't line up nice and neat and easy. It's really hard to understand the connectivity, the impact, the dependencies that exist between all of these components. And you say, well, hey, look, you know, at least we've got some tools to monitor these things. But we find in organizations, they might say that I've got, you know, my native tools that are, are specific to my vendors. Maybe I've got some EUEM, some end user experience, some APM, some infrastructure monitoring, some network performance uh, management, some logs. And then we've got our ITSM tools that are managing the incidents that are happening. And we've got all these teams, but each little tool is looking at just a portion of this very complicated set of infrastructure being seen by individual sideload teams. And to make matters worse in a lot of cases, each tool is creating their own incidents. They're creating a lot of noise in the system for what is ultimately the same issues that are occurring. So we know that's that's really, really challenging. And we believe that there's uh, a lot of reasons why we want to improve this. We say, like, if we look at the, the issues that are out there, uh, oftentimes because of this complexity, this, this spider of things that are occurring or spaghetti that are uh, happening, when there are issues that occur, oftentimes we're still finding out about it because a user is calling up to say that the issue has occurred and we didn't pick it up. We had all these monetary signals, but we still, the user is the one that's telling us that the service is impacted. And when we go to look and, and identify why that's occurring, well, there's a lot of finger pointing going on because different teams are looking at different siloed data and they're looking at their portion of the data and there's not like a clear understanding of the overall context. And the other implication here is that it reduces our ability to go fast because if we don't have the confidence to release quickly and know that it's going to be safe or that we can recover fast, then we don't, we don't go fast. And, and if, you've, uh, if you're practicing SRE models and say you use something like an error budget or maybe it's just your, your SLAs, if you've used up all of your SLA or all of your error budget, you can't release faster. And the last thing is we oftentimes try to solve these problems by taking our most expert resources and putting them all onto a bridge, which is far from, from efficient on people's time. It's a huge distraction. And then ultimately the decision becomes, well, we're just going to throw a bunch of additional resources at this problem. And hopefully maybe that makes it go away. So we're not real efficient with, with the resources that we're using. So we believe that there's a better way. We believe that by using observability and AI-driven insights and automation, that we can improve the customer satisfaction, the business agility, and the productivity. But in order to do that, we think there's three key areas 
that need to be addressed. And that's going to be the focus for us as we look at what we're doing in our product roadmap and what we do with the features that we deliver. And those three areas are understanding service health so that we can understand not just if you have a, an event that is occurring on a server, but what service is impacted, what users are impacted, when an issue does occur to uh, stop the blame game and focus on what data we have that can tell us what the problem is and then to be able to solve it very quickly. And then ultimately our ideal state that we wanna to get to is where we start to become proactive, where we can predict the issues that are occurring. We can take action to prevent them and ultimately do all of that while optimizing the use of resources that we have. So not distracting our, our super experts within our teams and then also not throwing a bunch of unnecessary resources at the problem. So what's new in the releases and how are we helping to advance in those areas? So in the recent releases, two of the areas that we focus on that understanding the service health and the diagnosing and fixing problems faster. So I wanna just level set on terminology. When we say BMC Helix ITOM, we're talking about discovery, operations management, and AI ops and continuous optimization. So we're using the power of these uh, solutions oftentimes together in order to uh, provide these capabilities. So I'm gonna walk through uh, each of these capabilities. And then as you heard, we've, we're very fortunate to have Matthias on the call and he's gonna show them to you live. So the first area, this one is so important, is we've enhanced our service modeling with something that we call service blueprints. So in order to understand not that server one has CPU over 90%, but to understand that our customer portal is running below its normal health score, we have to understand the relationships that exist between the various resources that we have in our environment. To understand that server one is critical to that customer portal. And in order to do that, we have to have service models. And I, I talk to customers all the time and they say, yes, service models, we have to get the service models. The challenge is, is that they're oftentimes hard to create. So if you're trying to do this manually, we've heard customers that have built these out in the CMDBs, it's taken months to build the service models. And they knew as soon as they finished it, it was out of date. So with change that's occurring, whether it's because of DevOps teams pushing lots of changes, or whether it's because you're using cloud and container resources that are constantly changing, it's very tough to build and maintain those service models. And so in order to help with this, we've created a new construct called service blueprints. And what the service blueprints allow you to do is to define out what a template looks like for a service. Well, do you care, is it based off of a, a set of, of Kubernetes pods? Does it involve these network components? What's the amount? What is the aperture that you want to see when you look at the service? Maybe you want to create composable pieces that then you're bringing together. And so that's what the blueprint does. Not only does it give you that ability, but we also provide out of the box blueprints that you can leverage in order to uh, quickly create your service models from those blueprints. And now once you have those blueprints in place and you instantiate services from the blueprints, that's where you can translate that server one CPU at 90% is impacting that customer portal. Super important information. The next really exciting thing that we've got, and this is where, you know, touching on that GPT, the AI that everybody's super excited about generative AI is we call it situation explainability and we're using our Helix GPT in order to, to, to get this. And so when I, when I describe the kind of situation that you run into, so we said, what happens? You have an outage that occurs. And so probably you, you brought on your app team, you got your infrastructure team, the people managing your servers, you've got your network team, your database team, your storage team, you put them all onto a bridge. And you look at, all of the events that have been happening recently and all the metrics that are out there. And maybe there's a ton of different incidents that you're trying to correlate all together. And what you ultimately wanna do 
is to figure out what's the root cause. And if it's like most organizations, it initially starts out where the app team goes, it's not us, it's not us, it's gotta be the server. And the server team goes, it's definitely not us, it's gotta be the database. The database says, no, it's not me, it's not me. This time it's not me, I promise. It's the network. And that's, we all know, that's where we, we, we just blame the network until the network can prove that it's not the network team. Well, this is about taking the information that we have and then being able to understand the impacts within that architecture to start with the root cause. So instead of getting on that bridge and instead of distracting all of your experts for all of these various technologies, it's about starting with the team and the area that is most likely the root cause. So if it really was the network team, why did we wake up the app team and the server team and the database team in the middle of the night to get on a bridge? We could have started with the network team and we could show them why it was the network that was the problem. And where the, the, the generative AI piece comes into this is some of the products, when, when we look at AI ops, they do event correlation. And this is nice because you ultimately can create less incidents because you're taking all these events that are occurring and instead of looking at them as individual events, they're grouped together, correlated together to say that these are all about the same situation. Overall, they're part of the same situation and we're only gonna create one incident for that situation. That's great from a noise reduction perspective. So you're creating less incidents, but ultimately when you get on that team call, you gotta go through and read every single one of the incidents. So if it's a thousand incidents, you got to look through it to understand what the root cause is. Now where the generative AI part of this is so interesting is that it can read through all of those events that are there and generate what it thinks is a summary of the issue that's actually occurring. So you can start at the top level and actually understand what's the problem without having to go through and read every single one of the events. So really exciting. Uh, and you're gonna see it firsthand from Matthias later. The next one that we're really excited about, and this is a, you know how do we diagnose and resolve problems faster is situation fingerprinting, another one powered by AI. And so if I set the context, um, <clears throat> I remember early in my IT days, we had this issue, we had an application that would go out and the application would go out. Uh, we couldn't put our finger on it, but it was like, for one, it always happened late at night on a weekend, but it wasn't really clear like how frequently it was, but the application would always go down and we couldn't figure out, you know, what's, what's going on here. And, and that's because it's really hard for humans to, to be able to remember all of the details and, Maybe one time we missed it or one time the app didn't go down. And so what we do with fit fingerprinting, situation fingerprinting, is we say, look, the reality is, is that oftentimes the issues that are occurring have already occurred. In fact, we believe that more than 50% of the situations are similar to ones that we probably have already corrected in the past. But the challenge is identifying that it is similar. So fingerprints look at things like, what were the type of events that came in? What was the source of those events? And that generates a fingerprint. And so when we see a new situation that occurs, we can automatically identify with the AI that this looks like something we've seen before. And that gives us the ability to drill down to look at those previous occurrences and identify things like, okay, well, was there an automation that we already ran? Was that automation successful? And so it helps us to speed up that time to resolution by using the knowledge we've already obtained from seeing this in the past. All right, one more thing. Now, I told you about the things that are already in the product today. These ones have been in the past couple of releases that we've had out there. There's something that's happening in the future. And we wanna give you the opportunity if this is an area that interests you to get involved while we're doing the development. And that's around what we call deep container discovery. So if you're a discovery user today, a BMC Helix or BMC discovery user today, there's a good chance that you're using the product to do things like understand what are the software license risks that might exist. Maybe you use it to identify 
uh, specific versions of software that might contain vulnerabilities to understand what, what's your uh, attack surface, what's, what's your risk surface that you have out there, or, or maybe you're using it to understand the relationships between the various resources that make up your service and service models. Well, we know that a lot of you are starting to use containers and we're starting here with Kubernetes specifically when we're talking about it, um, but it'll expand out from there. And so this is about doing deep container discovery, which means we look inside of the containers to see the software that's running on those containers so that it gives you that real-time visibility into what is your software license risk for the software running in the containers? What are the potential vulnerable software that you have based off of the versions of software that are running in those containers? And then the relationships between the various components or software that's running in those containers and other resources, either external or in other containers. So if this is something that you're currently, uh, uh, an, a thing that you're working on, a challenge that you have, um, my, my uh, coworker, Shafi Mani, uh, is running a, uh, a design partner program around this deep container discovery. His email is right here on the slide. If this is something that interests you, please reach out to Shafi. Uh, he's definitely looking for design partners. All right, and with that, I'm very happy to hand it over. I think that oftentimes talking about things is great and, and pictures are great, but ultimately seeing it live in action is the way that you can see the, va the value the most. And so we're so fortunate to have Matthias on this call. Matthias, I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, to take everybody through these really great capabilities. Thank you, JT, thank you. So we have picked like three scenarios or th Three value cases, actually. It's it's not even scenarios. I think it's the real the real value that is that is important here uh, that I want to demonstrate to you live in the platform in the product. The first one is, and it, I think many customers even calling them the game changer, right? It's it's service blueprints. JT mentioned it. It's just so fantastic how easy it is now to create those services to be able to use products and functionality like AI ops. Um, in the scenario two. And, and three, you can combine those two. It's really about getting the situation capabilities that we have, the AI machine learning based situation capabilities and store those situations as a fingerprint. Why this is important, I will show you live in the demo. And in addition, we have Helix GPT to enrich the information that is already there, that's already fantastic with a summary. So having said that, I will now switch over to the live demo and I will share my screen. So, okay, fantastic. So we're now in, in AI Ops, um, and maybe you're already familiar with the screen. So we want to start with the service blueprint part. Um, why is it important to have service blueprints in, in the product, um, in an AI Ops solution? So everything starts with the service blueprints or the service model, let's say. And the service model that you can see here is okay, there's already a problem happening. You see the CIs that that are potentially um, yeah, responsible for the problem and the CIs that are affected by the problem. But the thing is really, how do we get there to have that model? And um, if you're surprised why that model is maybe not that complex, it's just a, a great capability to make things easier that already AIOps is doing for me. So the model is bigger than it actually is, is visible for me. But the core, the core question here is, how do I get to such a model, right? How do I create something? And that's where we introduce service blueprints. And as you can see, we have already a list of out of box available blueprints that will ship with the solution. So you don't start from scratch. You can use uh, existing container blueprints, existing uh, VM to service blueprints. They are there right now for you to use, right? And of course you can take them and change them as, as you want. I will show you one example that I've created already. Pretty simple multi-tier architecture here from application server, web server, database server, classical architecture. And I see those service blueprint design, you can compare it to uh, talking about cars or designing cars, right? Uh, just take three different cars, a BMW, uh, BMW M5, for example, a Lamborghini Huracan, or maybe a Camaro, right? So three different cars, but they have things in common, right? They have an engine, pretty powerful engine. I think we all can agree. They have a window, they have a rear bumper, 
they have doors. They have more components from the similar type, right? But they have different engines, different windows, different steering wheels. So different CIs, but the CI types are pretty, pretty much the same, right? And if you talk about designing those car brands or, or streamline them, uh, I think we can perfectly translate them into how you build those blueprints, right? So you def define the types and by having one filter item, you start maybe with BMW or you start with Camaro. It could be an application server. It could be a Jira. It could be a Confluence. It could be a custom application. You start somewhere, the rest gets filled automatically, populated automatically. So pretty powerful. And I know from our own uh, operations team, they use a, one blueprint for more than 100 services. So it's not a one-to-one -one ratio anymore from service design to service. It's a one service blueprint, multiple services. That's why it's so powerful. And in the demo, I want to demonstrate you how easy it is to create a new service based on the blueprint. So we go to the services, create a new service, and we pick Jira as an example, and we select the dynamic content part, which means we want to be, uh, base the service on the blueprint. I select exa exactly the blueprint that I selected before and I showed you. I define the starting point, which is my Jira production. I can preview the content, automatically populated, and I'm happy with that. And I will save that service for me. So in few clicks, by having the blueprint defined before, which is also a very fast process, by the way, I have a new service, bottom right, called Jira, that has a specific service model as a foundation. So if right now there will be an event coming in, uh, things will go south maybe, uh, AI ops will take over, provide me intelligent uh, situation, uh, providing me root cause analysis, everything will happen right now. So very fast, very flexible, and if I now identify, oh, I forgot the networking components, right? If I group that, there's no networking in, I could still go in here and say, I need to maybe extend my blueprint, right? So I will go to the blueprint and say, I need to have network as well in. Let's, let's do that. I know that there are two network interfaces attached to the host level. And then we have a device at the end. Let me just go up here, save it again. So I've, I've changed the blueprint. Related services will change automatically. Let's close that. Go back to the service. Go back to the Jira. And if it loads, you will see now network devices in here as well. So pretty easy. All the components, you have everything in from mainframe components down to the networks, everything in one solution. So the next... The next scenario that we had was actually situation-based scenarios, right? So let's take a situation that we have here. We have a situation and let's take it from bottom to top because I think that perfectly describes and displays the evolution that we have in our AI ops solution. Um, we started with the service modeling to having that, to making the, the root cause analysis happening, uh, defining what is causing the problem, Everything is there. Then we took it one level further. We added really the causal path from the CI that is starting the problem, let's say, to all the items that are that are affected by it, right? We have all those events that are coming in tied to those CIs, right? We had them in a list, of course, first, but we have it also in a graph. You would see changes happening, everything in one situation, right? And that's the situation, by the way, that we store as a fingerprint. So when we talk about fingerprinting, it's actually what you see here right now on the screen is stored for further research, for additional use cases in our knowledge graph. It is stored as a fingerprint. And if you look at the top, you see Insta Banking Service down, the message, right? So what that would mean is here is Helix GPT at work. You can see it right now. It is actually summarizing what we see here on the graph, what we see here in the service model, it is summarizing in text to give me as an operator um, a perfect summary of what is going on, what is causing 
which problem, what is the effect by it, everything in one box. That's how powerful that is. So that everything is captured in the situation, right? In addition, what we, what we, when we take it one level further, I always refer to it as a time traveling capability because you're never the first person who has a problem typically, right? So I can see that the same situation or a, a similar situation has happened multiple times before, right? And I could take a look at those. I could see, okay, nine hours ago, there was a similar situation happening. Let's look into that one. So I can, I mentioned the fingerprinting capabilities before. I use that capability now to go to that fingerprint, to go to that situation actually, um, to see what, what, what went wrong that time, right? Maybe even the service model was different back then, which events came in, which CIs were affected, where was the root cause? But what is pretty powerful here is I can even see not only the root cause, but I could also take a look in, oh, there is an automation already happened last time. So somebody triggered a cleanup uh, policy here and to free up space maybe, and it solved the problem, right? So it's all about confidence. If you trigger automation, which we can do, of course, um, to have confidence, okay, that worked last time. Um, I saw, I see it here on the screen. It was a successful operation here. Uh, so I'm confident if I do it again, there's a high probability that it will solve the problem again, right? So that is really time traveling in action that you have here. And if you want to translate the GPT capabilities that we have, I always refer to it as it's like treasure hunting, right? Back then here, I mean, if you look down, we have the map where the golden uh, the golden uh, chest is, is, is quite in the hole, right? You have the map, you see exactly, okay, you can go here and there and you have all the details. But if you have something like Helix GPT as well in the game, it would be like you have somebody standing next to the gold and telling you, hey, Matthias, you need to dig here two meters deep, right? You have that level of accuracy here happening. So I think very powerful and uh, a great, great release is happening. And I know that in the future, there will be a recommendation happening here and, and so on. So I think fantastic what's going on here. So going back to John or JT. Cheers, uh, Matthias. And I love uh, when we get to see uh, the demo, uh, it really brings to life, I guess, everything that uh, JT was uh, talking about uh, earlier in, in the slides as well. So thanks for taking us through that. I mean, um, it really kind of brings the whole thing to life. Really, really powerful stuff. Uh, so I guess we're, we're moving towards our Q&A uh, section, but I just wanted to highlight a couple of things here. Uh, recently, uh, BMC were named uh, the leader for the Forrester Process Centrix uh, AI Op Wave, AI Ops Wave, sorry, and we were delighted, right, to to come out of the front uh, in this particular report because this report covered thirty separate categories. It covered there everything from like our current offering right the way through to what's happening in our roadmap and and everything in between, and it was a really really strong and comprehensive uh, report. So. I'm going to share that report with you in the link um, after this presentation, but just wanted to let everyone know that, that BMC has uh, has taken this leadership position from uh, from Forrester. And if we just look on to the next slide, what I wanted to call out uh, in the next slide here as well is, so Forrester has called us out as a leader in their uh, process-centric AI ops wave, but same also happened with, uh, with GigaHome in their uh, radar report as well. So you can see like the analysts that are reviewing our propositions and are reviewing our AI ops capability. They're really kind of verifying what we're uh, talking about within the marketplace and we're building out our um, our analyst uh, verification as well. So uh, we'll be sharing all of those with you as well. But not alone are the analysts uh, loving what they're seeing here as well. We're also starting to win some uh, trade shows and industry shows and industry events. And we recently won a um, AI ops award at a TM Forum event, which is uh, hosted in Copenhagen. That was only a couple of weeks ago there as well. So you can see like people are getting engaged with the product. They're loving what they see and they're really uh, you know, uncovering kind of great value from our AI ops uh, proposition and our AI ops uh, product. So uh, I think we can move on to our Q&A section. And the good news is we've got lots and lots of uh, questions today. Um, so JTSC, you, you've popped back up again, and that's um, that's good timing. 
one of the, the first kind of questions that I'd like to, to kick us off with is just around um, service blueprints. One of the things that we spoke about and showed in the, in our webinar today. So we've got a question here around service blueprints are great. Is there a roadmap to sync service blueprints with continuous optimization? Yeah, absolutely. That's uh, something that we're working on and there's already the ability because the service models that get created from those blueprints uh, are essentially stored in the discovery uh, graph database. And there's already the, an ETL that will pull in those service models from uh, discovery uh, into continuous optimization. So I'd say the output side of it, absolutely already something that you can utilize. And then as far as the user experience of being able to navigate over and build those if you want uh, is something that is on the roadmap. Thanks. Okay, that sounds good. Yeah, so uh, we got another question, which is a question that I love, right? It's around kind of pricing. Uh, I just kind of answered that one earlier. Let's get the person who's looking for pricing uh, synced up with an account manager. So we'll, we'll come back to you on that particular one. Uh, we got a question around, um, uh, I guess this one's around capacity management and use cases around capacity management. So maybe JT, just a kind of couple of use cases, high level use cases that you would... Uh, be able to share with people when it comes to capacity management from a, an AI ops point of view? Yeah, yeah. So uh, a couple of things. So when we start to look at AI ops and, and we, we talked about those three levels, uh, understanding service health, uh, the being able to diagnose and predict or prevent or not diagnose and prevent, but the uh, being able to understand then uh, the issue that's occurring and then to remediate the issue, diagnose and remediate. And then the last one was about being able to predict, uh, to prevent, and to optimize. That's really the portion in that last bucket where the continuous optimization product really shines in the overall landscape of AI ops. It's about being able to look at the data that you've got and to be able to identify problems that might occur. And so a couple of the big areas specifically in the use cases are around saturation prediction, so being able to look at trending, not just for like the past um, six hours or 12 hours that you might get with some predictive alerting, but to be able to look at trends to give you sufficient time, especially let's say if you're running something in your own data center to make sure that you have sufficient capacity with days, like multiple days in advance. So if you've got a, a workload running in Kubernetes or in, inside of VMware, being able to realize that maybe your VMware cluster is going to run out of resources trending towards over the next 30 days, you're gonna run out of resources. That allows you as an IT operations organization to take action and resolve it on a more realistic time frame, so that it's not interrupts to your work. It's not a distraction to your work. And the other real big area that we see a lot of customers getting value out of is we call what if analysis or what if simulation. So if you know that there's an upcoming business event that's going to occur, say it's Black Friday or a market launch, and you know in business terms how you think that this is going to be impacted. So you know that you do maybe an average of a thousand transactions a day, but you're expecting during this peak period that it's going to be 10,000. Well, you can plug that 10,000 number, the business number in to the what if simulation, and it's going to tell you what are the resources that you need in order to support that business objective or that business need that you're gonna have? And that's another way that's really important for getting out in front of these issues and preventing them before they ever even occur. Cheers, JT. And I think there are like lots of different use cases and capacity when it comes to kind of capacity and management. So I think um, our, um, our product portfolio really kind of addresses a huge amount of those use cases for customers. So. Yeah, there, we could go on for days and hours on that particular one, you know, uh, but great, great question. Thanks for that. Uh, we also got a question around, um, you know, if I already have a service model uh, built in the CMDB, can I use these in AI ops? Yeah, so you can you can bring in your service models in from from your CMDB uh, and, and leverage some of the, the pieces of that in AI ops. But uh, I think there was a really good aspect to the question, which is talking about organizationally, what's the governance model look like, uh, which I find really interesting. And, and I, I love that somebody asked it in this way, because it's true. 
there's the technology side to this, but there's also the people in the process side to it as well. And so I, what, what we found is, is that CMDB based service models are good for capturing the top layer. What's the business service? Who owns the service? Who to contact? That level of information. But where it can't keep up is with the amount of change that occurs based off of DevOps making lots of changes to the application, uh, and then modern infrastructure that's dynamically changing on a frequent basis. What are the number of resources? What are the pods? What are the cloud resources? And so this is where you really need to look at this more holistically. And uh, the, the person that asked this question, great question. Here's what I would recommend. Look at defining that top level in your CMDB. And if you have the level below that, yes, let's sink some of that down, but ultimately leverage service blueprints as a way to connect the actual resources that are part of your service, because it's going to be able to sync and keep up to date way better than you're going to be able to do normally in your CMDB. Yeah, it's funny. Uh, it's when we talk about like service blueprints and those kind of um, topics, uh, JT, it always seems to resonate a huge amount with our customers. It just, um, you know, it hits home, I guess, how tricky it is to do it kind of manually. And then when they see it kind of like from the, from, I guess, our AI ops offering, it always kind of opens people's eyes. It's a, it's a hot topic, a hot topic. Like, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, that's great. Okay, so we did get a question here around uh, customer numbers around in production using AI ops, but I don't have the exact number on that. What I can say is every single week we're deploying more customers with our uh, uh, you know into production. So um, you know we don't publish numbers of those kind of live, but it's an ongoing I guess uh, success story that we're pushing them out week after week. So we we love to kind of see that as well. Um, yeah. It's it's in the hundreds, and uh, and then when you also look at the Helix overall, it's it's well above that. It's in the thousands. Okay, okay. There's a question here. I think it's more around kind of licensing, but it's more kind of um, it's specific to Helix log analytics uh, from the ITOM stack. So I think this person is uh, is asking, right? Uh, is it possible to only get the Helix log analytics solution from our ITOM stack without buying all the other, uh, I guess, components within it? Yeah, so today we, we look at log analytics as part of a component of the larger observability and AI ops uh, solution that we create. Um, so we, we've, at the moment, not taken the position to go to market specifically as uh, log analytics, although we've got some great capabilities there. Um, we look at it as an addition to understanding overall how things impact your service, and then as you look at root cause, being able to pivot from that impacted service, and then what is the, the component maybe that has the problem, and then down to the logs. And so it's, it's, it's not that it's not technically possible, it's just that that's not the go-to-market approach that we've chosen to take. Yeah, and I think when our customers get get most most value is when they start combining the components together and they're all yeah. kind of working, yeah, working seamlessly. So uh, yeah, no, that makes perfect sense. Um, Okay, I think that's more or less it when it comes to our questions, unless um, anyone else can spot any other questions that they see out there. No, I think you've covered them all. I just answered the question was about uh, the health indicator or how service impact was, was shown on the live demo. It's covered as well. Okay, do you want to cover that just for, for attendees? This was the underlying KPI metric question, was it? Yeah, yeah. So it, it's a combination, I would say, right? Of course, we have the service model, but as we know, when we talk about clusters and, th and things, it can get complex, right? And you need to maybe uh, do some adjustments because you know best what is, what is happening. Uh, so we have also health indicators that you can design uh, based on the service level. It's very powerful. I've not shown it in live demo, but I think we can make a session only for that. So, but it's it's a dynamic thing going on based on the service model generally. Maybe JT, you right. want to add something on that? Uh, no, I think you, you covered it great. Thanks, Matthias. Yeah. Yeah, so I just, for everyone's benefit, I guess uh, the question was around, how do you know that the, the Instabank uh, is down and what's the underlying KPI metric? So that's what Matthias was just clarifying for, uh, for us just there. Yeah, I think uh, Samantha, 
Um, that's more or less it from our side today. Um, I guess for just from my point of view, I'll be dropping links um, into a lot of the kind of collateral for everyone as a follow up, and uh, like the the thank JT and Mateus and everyone for for attending uh, mm -hmm. this, and obviously for Samantha for helping us pull it all together.